130th anniversary gala. Amen. Amen. My name's Don Crow, and I'm, an, I'm honored to be your MC for the evening. We have some exciting things that are prepared for you throughout the evening. And uh, how many of you love DC traffic? You just love driving in it. Uh, you folks, we have a psychiatrist outside. He'll check with you after you leave. I thought of that and I thought, you know what, DC traffic's worth it if you can get to something like this, amen? So it's been well worth it, I'm sure, your drive, and I think when you leave this evening, that's exactly what you'll say, that you were glad you could be here. And we really, again, I repeat myself, but we're honored that you chose to come here tonight and to uh, bless this evening with your own love and your own prayers and your own presence. Now just quickly let me tell you what the evening is going to include. After dinner we'll be hearing about the exciting ministry as, as it has grown. I've had the privilege of having David Treadwell on the radio program a number of times and uh, in the years I've been here I've been amazed at what God's been doing under his leadership and that of all the people there. But he'll be giving us an update as to uh, where things are now and where they are headed for the future. Also have some great music from a wonderful artist and friend, uh, a CD record, uh, recording artist, and uh, he's actually the Minister of Music at First Baptist Church of Glenarden, Stephen Hurd. Uh, we'll hear testimonies of, excuse me, some lives that have been changed, and that's the bottom line. Changed lives really is what is the proof uh, of uh, the effectiveness of this great work. And uh, then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we'll be hearing from our main speaker, Nancy Roman, who's the president of the Capital Area Food Bank. So a great evening, and uh, a lot more even than I would take time to tell you now, but some video material and so forth. But we're going to start by asking Roy Wright, the president of Central Union Mission, uh, going to bring some official greetings and uh, lead us in our opening prayer. And then we invite you to just enjoy the meal and the fellowship. Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Roy Wright, the president of the board uh, here at, for Central Union Mission. On behalf of the entire board, I'd like to welcome you to this evening. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I so appreciate you guys taking the time to be here tonight to celebrate with us 130 years. It's a long time. There are a lot of programs and institutions that come and go, but 130 years serving um, folks in the district. And so we are very grateful tonight for the partnership we have with you and the investments that you make in this ministry, your support, so that we can bring hope to the hopeless and help to the helpless. So we're tonight we'll celebrate that legacy and we'll celebrate your commitment uh, to the needy and the marginalized in Washington, D.C. So, to keep us moving, I'd like to pray and ask God's blessing on the food. Father, we are grateful for the countless men and women and children we've been able to impact. We're thankful for the faithful support of those that are here tonight. So just as our friends at the Gale School this evening prayed, come bless this food. Sustain us and all those that we serve in your name. Amen. Well, good evening. Thank you, Don, for the st good start tonight. Also, I just learned it's not only the mission's birthday, but it's also almost our guest speaker's birthday. So happy birthday, Nancy Roman, as well. Now, I'm going to ask some people to stand up. And hold your applause, please, until we get the whole group. And then we'll, we're going to have a good time celebrating each other. First of all, 
I would like to ask our wonderful host committee, our sponsors, and our table hosts, if you would stand up. All of our table hosts, our host committee, our sponsors, thank you so much. Yes, your host committee. <laughs> now, please remain standing. I would like to ask those of our board of directors who are not already standing, you please stand up too. And if you're already standing, wave your hand so people will know who our board of directors members are. <laughs> okay, now ho hold your applause. We're going to celebrate at the end. Now, pastors and ministry leaders, if you're one of our sister ministries or a pastor, if you're the leader there, please stand up. And let's celebrate all of you. Great, lots of pastors. You folks just can't resist applauding. You're going to use up all my time. Just keep standing, pastors. I saw you sit down, Hartman. Okay. <laughs> Now, our Gale School construction team, I understand some of them heard we were too crowded and didn't come, but Will, I know you're here. Anybody else from the construction team? Kevin, you're here. Please stand up if you're part of B&D or any of that crowd. Okay, now, I don't have enough people standing up. Central Union Mission staff and spouses, please stand up. Okay, we've got... Several of them here, that's a good thing. Now, the people that are seated, sitting, seating, seated, sitting down, <laughs> are our volunteers, our financial church and business partners, and our prayer warriors. So those of you standing up, I want you to thank those who are sitting down for being here tonight, because that's what it's all about. Now, you may be seated and enjoy your applause. Thank you for being here. Walking the streets of the nation's capital, you are quickly reminded of the problem of homelessness. But closer examination reveals a far greater problem. The working and struggling poor far outnumber the homeless. And hunger is never restricted to homeless people. As Christians, we are called to serve people, both homeless and inadequately housed people, underemployed and unemployed people, people on welfare, and people with little hope of faring well. The mission gives hope to people who have not experienced equal opportunity, may have endured racism or other social injustice, poorly educated people, and people who have never enjoyed a supportive family or the basic necessities of life. But smiles appear on children's faces. Men find work and seniors socialize in safety and warmth. Through the mission's long history, it has been flexible to meet the pressing needs of the day, and it strives to continue doing so in 2014 and the years ahead. It's ego boosting to be Washington's oldest social service agency. It's liberating not to depend on government aid. And we enjoy the accolades for feeding and clothing thousands, preparing scores of men to return to work, and making back to school and Christmas happy times for children. But tonight, I want to start with our first love, your mission was born to rescue alcoholic men off, the, off of Pennsylvania Avenue through introducing them to the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In all the things we share this evening, please keep in mind the Lord's warning to the Ephesians in Revelation. I know your deeds. You've persevered and endured hardships and not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forgotten your first love. Central Union Mission's first love is to share God's love and good news, not only with poor people, but with all who cross its path. As the mission's 19th century ministry to alcoholic men, wandering Pennsylvania Avenue matured 
and succeeded, the people of Washington embraced the expansion into children's emergency ministry in 1917. In the Great Depression, when there was no support for families with literally starving children, the mission took them in. During World War II, lonely military men and women far from home were served by the mission. And in 1952, the mission's work expanded to include families. Spiritual transformation training began in the 1980s and added depth to the Christian training for men. And in 1998, ministry to Spanish-speaking people began. Adjusting to the needs of the people has been the mission's hallmark. I'd like to take a few minutes to share the mission's ministries today. You sort of saw them on the video, but let me just refresh your memory. First of all, it didn't mention finance, administration, and partnership. We see those as ministries as well. These, the staff in these areas are saving us space by having a facility away from 65 Massachusetts Avenue. They are serving in a pleasant building in Northeast DC. But one of the most important messages I could bring to you tonight is that these people are absolutely committed to integrity and sound management. The distribution of food has become a primary outreach of the mission. And the 11,000 foot uh, food plus center on Bladensburg Road allows storage and weekly sharing of groceries, clothing, and even furniture with hundreds of individuals and families in need. Today, far more women and children are assisted by the mission than men. Last year, our sister mission, Gospel Rescue Ministries, transferred their assets to Central Union Mission. We are grateful for their trust and for these increased opportunities. Lambert House in Southeast serves low-income families with six units and with a total of 24 bedrooms. Gospel Mission's Fulton House, renamed the Gospel Mission House, is providing transitional housing for 15 students or working men and offices for the social work department. Food and clothing are big attractions for impoverished families at the family ministry located in Mount Gilead Baptist Church on 13th Street. Training classes ranging from citizenship to basic reading Bible studies and counseling all take place in gentrified Northwest DC. Beautiful Camp Bennett in Montgomery County serves as it has since 1934. 400 poor children are blessed with swimming, hiking, ropes course, great food, crafts, and open space each summer. The restored Gale School at 65 Massachusetts Avenue in the heart of the city is stretching the mission's opportunities. Nightly, 170 men are housed, including overnight guests. Those are the true shelter occupants, the men off the streets. Three distinct work programs serve men who are ready and able to work. An elderly and disabled man and those pursuing education or employment are also provided for. Over 25 tutors and mentors, plus many partner organizations, help adults with training and education needs. From cooking to GED, preparation for opportunities are wide open. 10 carefully selected men at a time retreat to Camp Bennett for three months of Christian growth and discipleship through intense Bible training in the spiritual transformation program. Beds are also reserved for men under the care of the Veterans Administration and our sister ministry so others might eat. Legal, dental, and medical care, the haberdashery, exercise room, and two day rooms attract men off the streets to the Gales building. More than at any time in the mission's history, ministry and service are stretched today through partnerships, job training, education, health care, food, legal assistance, counseling, and oh so much more are supported by literally hundreds of individuals, organizations, churches, and even the government. Community activities like the recent Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's breakfast, health fair, and coat distribution regularly invigorate the staff. 
Guests and students also enjoy these events as we share the mission's facilities. Some great stories will be presented later. Friends, thousands of hungry, struggling homeless people and tens of thousands of unemployed and underemployed people are straining local resources. As tonight's keynote speaker will attest, the demand for food continues to grow rapidly. Your support enables the mission to respond to this accelerating need. Simply put, mission food distribution facilities have been outgrown. The Food Plus Center and the Family Center at Mount Gilead have been overwhelmed by people desperate for food. We are counting on the mission's partners to rally in the pursuit of an adequate space to serve. Increasingly, men who really want to work come to the mission, and this desire increases as they grow in their faith, preparing them to compete for jobs and training and directing them in their job searches demand staff and volunteer attention. Your support enables increasing opportunities for men to return to work. The facilities and equipment at 65 Mass Ave have opened a new door for teaching, training, and education, but the challenges remain great. Many adults struggle to reach ninth grade reading and math equivalency. Others are striving for, the, for their GED or high school diploma. And a special few are seeking college level education. Thank you for supporting adult education for poor and homeless men and women. The mission staff has grown to over 50 employees in seven locations. And the infrastructure has grown proportionately. But the mission's dependence on individual partners and supporters has never wavered. Friends like you have blessed this ministry for 130 years. As the needs of poor people in the district and the metro area have grown, so have the costs of trying to assist them. Minimum wage in DC is now over $9 an hour, and that impacts the mission's cost for our large pool of entry-level workers the goal is for all to earn a living wage. Financially struggling bulk food donors have eliminated their overages. The result, fewer food donations have caused food costs to greatly increase for meals and to fill the bags of groceries distributed to poor families. And we all recognize the increase in the cost of utilities and maintenance that accompanies more facilities and vehicles to support more people. We are blessed by these new facilities, but the men are much more cooperative when the showers are hot. The seniors really appreciate a warm building, and the children are a lot safer in a reliable bus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for caring, and thank you for serving and blessing people in need. This time I'd like to introduce our friend Jim Dempsey, longtime friend of mine both in ministry here and previously, and he's going to share opportunities that we have for you tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. What an incredible evening to celebrate 130 years of Central Union Mission Ministry. As Dave said, I consider myself a friend of Central Union Mission and have been for some time. I've seen the changes that occur in the lives of men, women, and children in the inner city. Countless lives changed for eternity. As we all know, we live in a challenging world. But we serve a big God, and he has the answers to our world's issues. The opportunity and importance of bringing the message of Jesus Christ, that message of hope, to the poor and homeless people in D.C. has never been greater. As Dave mentioned, we need to literally see the lives of these valued people change for eternity. And that's why we need your partnership and your help tonight. We must rally all possible support to meet this need over the next year. 
In order for us to accelerate this and take advantage of the growth and the plans that God has placed before us, we're going to need to raise more than $260,000 this evening. Specifically, to undergird our 2014-2015 budget, we're going to need to increase, as Dave mentioned, the services to meet the growing demand for food service secure a better distribution center for food distribution, serving poor and homeless people through workforce development, train in environmental sustainability, and increase the programs in continuing adult education. Now to give you an idea how your gifts will make a difference over the next 12 months, a gift tonight or over the next 12 months of $600 will provide 290 meals to be served at a cost of $2.09 a meal. If God would lead you to give a gift tonight or over the next 12 months of $1,200, that will provide three computers to help men and women get their GED. It's been said that 62,000 residents in the district lack a high school diploma and 71% of all jobs in the next 10 years will require post-secondary education. A gift of $2,400 over the next 12 months or tonight would provide six disadvantaged kids to attend Camp Bennett. A gift of $5,000 tonight or the next 12 months provides transitional housing for those moving from poverty to stability. This would be a room for a year in transitional housing for a student who has completed or is working towards their spiritual transition program. A gift of $10,000 tonight or over the next 12 months would provide a part-time chaplain to serve men, women, and children. A gift of $25,000 would provide a part-time tutor or truck for our work development program to help with the ready-to-work program. It's important to know that 75 percent of state prisons and 59 percent of federal prisons are filled with individuals who do not have a high school diploma or equivalency. That's what we're trying to do is make a difference. And lastly, a gift of $60,000. If God would lead you to give $60,000 tonight or over the next 12 months, would provide rent for the distribution center for a year. So with this specific goal in mind, we're going to need, as I said, to raise $260,000 tonight. And we're going to be asking you to make a faith investment later on this evening. And tonight, all faith promise investments will be going towards meeting our increased needs so we'll continue to sustain and expand this vitally important ministry. Now, I'd like to take a few minutes right now and explain what a faith investment is, and then later we'll be hearing some individuals whose lives have been changed through this ministry, and then we'll be hearing from our main speaker, Nancy Roman. Then I'll come back right after Nancy finishes and give you an opportunity to partner with us financially. Tonight's program has been designed specifically to show you why this ministry is effective and worthy of your support. Many of you are going to want to respond to the needs mentioned tonight. And even though you're under no obligation, I feel confident that you'll want to give. Now, there's three ways you can make a faith investment this evening. Simply making a cash offering that's just out of what you have in your possessions, cash, check, or credit card. Secondly, you can make a monthly commitment. Central Union Mission needs more monthly partners, individuals who are going to give on a regular basis. Now, you may decide to give over the next 12 months, but many of you may decide you want to give even beyond that time, and we would love to have you do that. And the third way you can make a faith investment is through a faith promise, and to me, that's a really exciting way to give. Now, if you don't know what a faith promise is, let me take a minute to explain. A faith promise is a commitment on your part to give by faith what God has placed uh, on your heart so that you can meet those needs this evening. To make a faith promise, you must pray and ask God how much he would have you give. Then, after he places that amount on your heart or mind, wait upon him. Trust him for that until it comes in. Then, as God provides, become the vessel for channeling those resources to Central Union Mission.
Now, the scriptural basis behind that is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, specifically chapter 8, verse 3, that says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. Now, when you give according to your ability, you're giving out of your resources. But when you give beyond your ability, you're giving out of God's resources. Our resources are finite. God's resources are infinite. A faith promise is not a part of your tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings come out of your income and are dependent on that income. By contrast, a faith promise is between you and God concerning a specific project or program or amount of money he lays upon your heart. A faith promise is not a pledge. A pledge is a horizontal agreement between you, a church, or other worthy cause. By contrast, a faith promise is a vertical agreement between you and God. Now, Central Union Mission may be the recipient of that agreement, but nonetheless, it's between you and God. Now, many of you already give to the programs, and we're not asking you to redirect any of that towards what we're trying to accomplish this next year. But if God leads you to give above, above and beyond that, we pray that he would lead you and you would respond that way. So I'm excited for you to hear what the rest of the program has in store for you. I'm excited by the testimonies and our main speaker. But right now, I'd like to call up Minister Stephen Hurd. Stephen is a renowned leader in the gospel music community. He serves as a music minister in music Minister for Music uh, for First Baptist Church Glen Arden in Landover, Maryland, and he's released two acclaimed recordings with Integrity Music, and he has a, has a stellar and Dove Award nominating songwriter and artist. Stephen, bless us with song, please. Thank you. It is a great honor to be here tonight to celebrate with Central Union Mission. I'm so excited about what God is doing uh, with this ministry, and I just want to worship the Lord and invite you to worship with me, all right? Come on, let's go. Father, tonight we honor you in this place. We invite you to follow your presence, Lord. We thank you for what you will do. We stand tonight as testimonies of your provision and your graciousness and your faithfulness. Father, we invite your power, we invite the glory of your presence to touch the hearts of these men and women and even the lives that will be transformed. We give you grace tonight. We celebrate you as our God. We declare you as our King. And in Jesus' name, we give you thanks. And all the people of God shouted. Come on, clap your hands. Come on.
like you're losing your mind. God bless you tonight. We serve a living God, a risen Christ. Amen. I remember years ago hearing, uh, well, that was the great C.M. Ward, radio preacher now home with the Lord. He said, the reason men hate Jesus Christ is that nobody hates a dead man. Amen? We serve a living Christ. Praise God. We have some folks who are going to share their testimonies with us. If they would come as I'm announcing them and just uh, come and stand here in order. Uh, D.C. Senator Michael Brown, also Reverend Daryl Fitterman, and Attorney David Hazelton. They're going to share briefly in turn. Thank you so much. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow a great act like uh, that. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful tribute. Um, I have a little bit of a bone to pick with you, Reverend. I want you to know that the reason that the traffic in my hometown is so bad is because of all the Virginia drivers that are clogging up our streets. <clears throat> but it's a great honor for me to be here tonight Thank you so much for inviting me. What a wonderful thing to celebrate 130 years of public service to our community. What a distinguished record of accomplishment. Can we have another round of applause for David Treadwell and all the wonderful people that work at the Central Union Mission? Thank you so much. I first came to know the Central Union Mission because they lived and worked in my neighborhood. I lived with my sister at Thomas Circle, a few blocks from the shelter at 14th and R Streets. I saw firsthand the important work they did for the less fortunate residents in our area. In those days, I was there before the mission came, and in those days there were very few people that reached out in our neighborhood, and the need was tremendous. I remember the simple words above the door, come unto me, from Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a creed that they have lived by for more than a century, faultlessly. I didn't need their help in those days, but I stand before you tonight as a United States Senator, because in my time of need, I had someone to help and comfort me. You see, I lost both my parents when I was 15 years old. Scared and alone, by the time I was 16, I had dropped out of school and started to get into trouble. I had lost my parents, my home, and my faith. Luckily, I had an older sister who protected me, cared for me, and nurtured me 
allowing me to regain my footing and get my life back on track. After a few years, I got a GED, worked my way through community college, a good university, and graduate school. I went on to start my own successful business, get married, raise three incredible children, and get elected to the office of United States Senator twice, the last time with 207 votes. And that's why I come here tonight. I come here because I know how far a little hope, a little help, and a little service can take you when it comes at a critical time in your life. The important work the Central Union Mission does changes lives, whether it's emergency shelter for the night, a needed meal, or out, re, outreach to the community. They continue to change lives by reaching out to those in need who are at the most vulnerable time of their lives. My sister Patricia and I lived in the shadow of the mission on 14th Street at one of the hardest times in our lives. With her help, I was able to carry on, live a fulfilling and productive life. I never got to give back to my sister for all that she did for me, because just as I started to become successful in my early 30s, she passed away. So I come here tonight in her name to say thank you to all the people who have given people like me a chance. Pat never forgot the mission. She moved, but she continued to give to the Thanksgiving program every year. I know that she would want me to be here tonight to say to you that helping each other is what reaffirms our humanity, that the only way to truly receive is to give, and that which lifts one of us lifts all of us. It's the way she lived her life and it's what Central Union Mission does every day. By serving those in our community most in need, they serve all of us. Through their network of volunteer staff and program graduates, Central Union Mission makes our community a more compassionate and caring place, and that's why we need to continue to support their important work. Every bit that we contribute to this work pays dividends for all of us, for this organizations like this that build and sustain our community. Matthew tells us that which we do unto the least of them, we do unto God. I believe this with all my heart. Thank you for your continued service to the Lord by serving the least fortunate among us. God bless you for your years of dedicated service to our city and thank you for allowing me to be part of the celebration of your incredible gift of caring to our community for more than 130 years. Thank you. Praise the Lord. My name is Daryl Fitterman. My story goes like so many others in the mission. Strung out on drugs, strung out on alcohol, strung out on just about anything you could get strung out on, but never reeled in, never given a place in which I could heal, never given a place in which I could have hope. In 1989 was the bottom of the barrel. As a matter of fact, it was, I was through the bottom at that point. I had been arrested for the intent to distribute a controlled substance, that's what it read. But I'll be honest, I was selling crack. And I was selling it right in behind of the US tax court in the District of Columbia. And the strangest thing is, is that my journey actually started years and years ago, but it ended up in that alleyway that no longer exists. Where Georgetown Law Library now sits is that, that alley. But the strangest thing is, is that God is so gracious. 
we call it a, a, a work of love and everything else, but I, I love the word when you use the word mission. Because that means you have a desired point and action and you want to continue to do something and reach a goal. Well, my goal was this, was to get clean, get, clo get sober, get some clothes on my back and get some food in my stomach. Strangely enough, I got more. Because by the grace of God, I was sentenced to community service at, of all places, Central Union Mission. <laughs> and my task was to wash and clean whatever they asked, mop whatever floor they asked, unload whatever they wanted me to unload. And I had 100 hours to complete. During the course of that, I saw men who had something that I lacked. Men who, for, for lack of a better word, they had Jesus. And I didn't. I, I'm, I'm just going to keep it real, Reverend Treadwell. They had it, I didn't. And I wanted it. And I thought that I could finagle my way in and everything else, but God has a plan. When God sets out to do a mission in your life, he has a plan. And God broke me down at the mission, put me on the spiritual recovery program. I stayed in the mission for nine months. And in the nine months, I learned not only was I broken, but there was nobody who was capable of putting me back together again except God. And I recognized all the holes in my life and all the mistakes I had made. But in the midst of all of that, I found a God who loved me unconditionally and who used Central Union Mission to put this man back together again. <laughs> Praise be to God. So when I left the mission, I left a, not only with clothes on my back and, and a few dollars in my pocket, but I also left with a God who promised never to leave me nor forsake me. And I have been walking with him since 1990. It's 2014, I know I'm fatter, that's God's grace. I know I'm grayer, that's God's mercy. I've got more wrinkles, that's his favor. Because strangely enough, God did not stop there. This is what the mission does. The mission is only the stop where God wants a man to be. It's his life that God really wants. And as a result of my coming through the mission, I'm now a pastor of a church, along with my beautiful wife. We, we share God's gospel wherever we go. And Minister Chambers, I'm sorry, you gave me a live microphone and I'm a preacher. <laughs> but I wanted to let you know is that your dollars, the money that you give, all those years ago, it gave me, I don't know about the 130, I was only there for nine months. But there are so many more that are coming after me. I ask you to dig deep, dig often, dig constantly. I looked on the program, there is a smileamazon.com, and this is my pitch. Every time I buy a book, and I buy a lot of books, I make sure I go to smileamazon.com. And I click and I make sure Central Union Mission gets some. I'm not rich, but I'm happy. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It's a privilege a privilege to support Central Union Mission. Why do you, why do we support Central Union Mission? Certainly it's because it's an effective ministry, certainly because it's a well-run ministry, but I think most fundamentally we support Central Union Mission because it is a fulfillment of God's command to us. In Sunday school, we're currently studying the prophet Amos, who declares God's word that let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Central Union's care for the homeless and needy in our area are at the core 
of God's call for justice. Again and again in scripture, we read of God's heart for the poor and needy. Central Union Mission brings joy to God as it serves the homeless and needy in our area. And importantly, it combines this mission of justice with a call to righteousness, just as the prophet Amos said. Central Union Mission doesn't just feed and shelter the homeless, it equips them to move forward in a new direction, in the direction of righteousness. Yes, it certainly equips them physically, but importantly, it also equips them with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This distinctive and critical part of Central Union's ministry sets it apart from other homeless shelters and ministries in the area. Please join me in supporting this ministry so close to God's heart with your prayers and with your pocketbooks. Give generously as you are able, for God loves a cheerful giver. Thank you, gentlemen, very, very much. We now come to the highlight of the evening in introducing our evening speaker, Nancy E. Roman, president and CEO, joined the Capital Area Food Bank in January 2013 after a 25-year international career spanning journalism, business, U.S. government, Wall Street, and the United Nations. In her present position, Nancy is responsible for the entire operation of the 34-year-old Capital Area Food Bank, the CFAB, which has an annual operating budget of $19.5 million, a staff of 130, and supplies 500 partner agencies in Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, and Maryland with food and nutrition training and education. Prior to joining the Capital Area Food Bank, she was the Director of Public-Private Partnerships and Communications at the United Nations World Food Program. Her numerous other accomplishments include serving as Vice President of Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C., President of the G7 Group, a consulting firm for Wall Street, and she spent 10 years as a journalist. She holds a Master of Arts degree in International Economics and American Foreign Policy from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Journalism and French from Baylor University. Nancy is married to Stephen Cohen and has two children, Daniel, Daniel and Taylor Beth. Would you welcome our guest speaker, Nancy Roman. <clears throat> Thank you so much. What an absolute pleasure it is to be with you tonight. Um, and just what an incredible amount you have accomplished, 130 years. Uh, you know, as a leader, David, I have to say, a real testament to you and the leaders before you to have really steered Central Union Mission through such a long period and to have led it flexibly and ably and, and with uh, passion. Um, we come together tonight at a time that's both very rich and very poor. We had a fabulous dinner tonight at the table, and we live in the richest country in the world, and we actually live in a very wealthy area of the richest country in the world. But at the very same time, there are about a billion hungry people in the world and 38 million of those live in the United States of America. And about 700,000 of them live right in our region that we serve, the Capital Area Food Bank. So that's the suburbs of Northern Virginia, where we are right now, and the suburbs of Maryland, Montgomery County, and Prince George's County, and the District of Columbia. 700,000 people are food insecure. and. Uh, <clears throat> it can be defeating. 
The Capital Area Food Bank, some of you know us, uh, we're serving 530,000 people in this area. And one of the things I've found when I've spoken is a lot of people don't really know the difference between a food bank and a soup kitchen and a food pantry and all these organizations helping people. A food bank is the regional organization that supplies partners like Central Union Mission. So when you're providing food to those homeless men who need it or providing meals in, in the Food Plus Center, um, we are procuring that food, securing it, getting it from farmers, storing it, putting it onto tr trucks, bringing it out. And I was thinking back, you know, to the beginning, I was realizing we feel very old at the food bank. We're 34 years old. And I was realizing at that time you all were well into senior citizenship, <laughs> almost 100 years old. And um, I was thinking back to 1980 when we were founded, and it was not long after I, as a 16-year-old um, high school student, had gone with my church in South Florida, Flamingo Road Baptist Church to Guatemala, where we worked in soup lines, dishing out this gray soup that smelled terrible. And even though I came up in a lower middle-class family, and, and certainly we struggled ourselves when we got closer to payday, the refrigerator was sometimes empty, but I'd never known people that had no food at all, you know, ever before. And I came back from that trap really motivated, but, you know, in those days we were really helping to feed people based on compassion. We just thought, you know, it's not fair that people are hungry, and it isn't. And we knew that it hurt, and we knew it was uncomfortable. Um, but we now have reasons that are so much more powerful to do what we're committed to doing. We have what I refer to as the burden of knowledge. Um, because we now understand that if you don't get nutrition in the earliest years, it's about your cognitive capacity. And if you don't have enough food in school, there's no education to follow. And we're now appreciating much more fundamentally that when you don't have food and nutrition in the earliest years, your immune system never, ever develops. Um, and when all through life and through adulthood, nutrition speaks to wellness and healing. And we certainly understand that nobody works well on an empty stomach. So we much more fully appreciate that taking care, ministering to people, feeding people, as at the very base of what we want as a strong society. It's at the base of education and health and employment. So, you know, people often ask me about the face of hunger because, as you were told in, in my introduction, uh, I spent the five years before I came to the food bank on the global stage um, working for the United Nations World Food Program. So we were feeding 100 million people in 75 countries all over the world. And I saw some very, very, very tough things in those, in those days. Uh, in Ethiopia, after the drought in 2008, driving through the southern part of that country to look at the clinics that were struggling to keep up, I saw men standing in line fall dead of hunger before my eyes. In Haiti, after the earthquake, I had a woman plead with me to take her baby with me because she couldn't feed that child. And I could tell many, many more stories, heartbreaking stories of the kind of hunger that I saw on the global stage. But I'll tell you, absolutely nothing has moved me more than the hunger I have seen in my own hometown when I came back to Washington and Virginia and Maryland, and I've lived in all three. I will not forget in March, March 2013, I went out with one of our truck drivers, and um, it was six o'clock in the morning, and the food delivery was to happen at 9 a.m. And we went out at six, and arrived at about 6.30, and the truck pulls up, volunteers meet the truck, and the truck is offloaded, and already at 6.30, 50 people had gathered in line. 
And by the time the truck was unloaded, about 75 people were gathered in line. And it was cold for March. It was early March, but it was cold even for early March. And I had, of course, a coat and plenty of warm clothes on. And I saw the people standing in that line and would be standing in that line for the next few hours before the, the volunteers arrived for the distribution. And I saw mothers with children. I saw seniors. And while I was standing there, this woman rode by in a broken down old car and she shouted out the window, Reverend Banks, please save some for me and my child because I'm on my way to work. I can't stop and get any food. And I'll tell you on that day, I realized, you know, I have come to the job that I will be so dedicated to because we cannot stand for that kind of hunger in the richest, nation on earth and the capital city of the richest nation of earth. It's completely unacceptable. And so <clears throat> I want to tell you another thing about the way hunger looks a, bit, a little bit different here than it does from the global stage. Um, you know, of course, when you're in Ethiopia and all over Africa and Bangladesh and, and in Haiti after the earthquake, so many of the people we're helping are emaciated and thin. And you come back home to this country and many of the people who are without food, hunger looks different because they're getting enough kilocalories. And that's something I've found people, even many, many generous donors like you and the donors who support the food bank don't fully appreciate. But if you wake up in the morning and you eat a honey bun for breakfast from the corner store, 50 cents with a red sticker on it, and then at lunch, you eat off the dollar menu. You know, fries and a burger and a Coke, three bucks. And then at dinner, you have a bag of chips. You've probably gotten more than twice the recommended daily allowance of calories you need to, to survive, but you haven't gotten any of the nutrients that you need. And the reason I tell this story is I admire Central Union Mission and those of our partners who appreciate this and are trying to adapt because the people who really succeed at conquering problems and really making a difference and helping people to develop sustainability for themselves, we have to take on these tough challenges and it's a lot of work that involves nutrition education. So I was happy to hear Charlotte say that she likes to see our trucks come in with the fruits and vegetables because we're delivering 17 million pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables, but it's got to come with education and talking about it. Uh, <clears throat> one of the most staggering statistics on that theme in the hunger study we just got back about who are we feeding, of the 530,000 people that we're feeding, nearly half have heart disease, or high blood pressure. Nearly half, 48%. 23%, almost a quarter, are diabetic. And so you can't hear these statistics without recognizing that we really have to not just get food to people, but get the right kind of food to people and begin dialogues like these. But the other thing I want to talk about that was in those numbers, to David's point, which I so much agree with, <clears throat> nearly 80% of the people that we're serving are working poor. And David and I were talking at, at dinner, um, much higher incidence of single moms working for the minimum wage with three kids. You do the math. Of, of what you're bringing home for the minimum wage if you're a single mom with three kids anywhere in this region, anywhere in this region, Fairfax, Prince William County, any of the four quadrants of the District of Columbia, Montgomery, or Prince George's County. You cannot live with a roof over your head and, and healthy food in your house and make ends meet. And so one of the things we're seeing um, of all the partners we serve, only about 5% of the people we're serving are homeless, and you're doing so much of that critical, important work. 
But I think something for us to understand is how close on a razor's edge so many people with shelters and homes are. They're just a breath away from being on the street, just a simple breath away. And I don't think people so fully realize, you know, that it can just be like that, you know, trying to buy medicine for a super sick family member, you know, can put you on the street. Or a very, very, very cold winter that puts heat out of reach. I was going to <clears throat> tell you the story of the Gittins family, but that video told it so beautifully that I, I'm not going to tell it again, but it's an important one, and I was with Humberto just on Friday, and I thank you for your ministry to him and to his family. And he came to our hunger summit where we were talking to people about healthy eating and cooking. And he was there actually demonstrating a recipe. And it is heartwarming to see, as the pastor knows, how much people want a chance and, and how just giving that small bit can put a chance within grasp. The last story I'm going to tell you is one um, I'm, I'm an empty nester now, as of four weeks ago, a big moment in life. And my youngest daughter, Taylor Beth, went to Elon University. And there was lots I could tell you about how hard that was for me to, to take her. Um, but the, the thing that I, the story that I want to tell you is one that touched me deeply and ties very directly to us tonight. Friday, I took her. It was move-in day. Many of you know what that's like. Um, chaos and bedlam. People are taking 16 trips to Target, and you know, there aren't enough clothes hangers, and you know, the moms are trying not to do too much, and the kids really are wishing you'd do a lot more. <laughs> and um, so we, we moved in, and it was an exhausting day. It must have been like 113 degrees in Elon, North Carolina. And at 4 o'clock, they had it divided so that the kids went off to be with the kids and the, and the parents went off to go to a parent session about being a good college parent. And, um, and then we all went our separate, the kids went back to the dorms and we went and collapsed. But the next morning, we came back for the convocation ceremony. And it was one of the most moving ceremonies that I had ever been in. The president, Leo Lampert, called the 1,400 students to the front of the university. And um, they were sitting under the oaks, and they get the acorn. And we, the parents, were in the back. And he, and he stood and he said, I'm going to begin this talk with a human bar graph. And so he asked all the 1,400 students to stand, and they stood. And he said, OK, I want the back seven rows of you to sit down. They sat. He said, OK, you represent the one billion people in the world who went to bed hungry tonight. And then he said, I'd like the next row to sit down. The next row sits down. You represent the number of people who don't have clean drinking water in this country. And then he moved through the list, and, and those standing were smaller and smaller. And by the end, you get to a very few hundred of the 1,400 who represent all the people in the developed world. And he said, OK, I want you three rows to sit down. And they sit down. And he says, OK, you represent the people who don't have a job. And then he continued to narrow and continued to narrow. And at the end, there were four people standing, four students of the 1,400. And he said, you represent the students who have a chance you have all the food you need. You have clean drinking water. You have roofs over your head. And you have a chance for a four-year education to study and prepare for what you want. Four of the 1,400. And he said, and a lot of people are going to tell you, oh, how lucky you are. Oh, how fortunate you are. He said, I, I'm going to tell you something very different. I'm going to say, what a responsibility you have to solve the world's global social problems. And so 
that message really resonated with me. I shared it with my staff and I share it with you here tonight because um, yes, we, we're privileged, we're lucky. If you're sitting in this room, you're very privileged, we're very privileged. But we're also responsible. And <clears throat> I wanna thank those of you who are stepping up to the plate. That's all of you in some small way. Um, but the task is great and stepping up makes a difference. And the very last thing I'll say is when the numbers are so big and so staggering, it can get frustrating. Whether it's one billion in the world who are hungry or 38 million in the country or 700,000 here or the tens of thousands that Central Union Mission is helping. But when you boil it down to Humberto Gittens, when you boil it down to a person and you see one human being, you realize that that human being magnified by those statistics. That's the power for change that you have. So I will just say it is an honor and a privilege to be a partner of Central Union Mission. We are proud to provide food and support and nutrition education. Um, we're proud of the work that you do. Um, never, ever, ever think it's insignificant and that it isn't making a difference, because it is. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, do we fulfill those expectations? It's amazing just the difference that we can make difference one individual can make, and that's why we're here tonight. Your table hosts have packets. Table hosts, if you would, please pass out those packets, and inside the packets are envelopes. Make sure that everyone at your table gets an envelope, please. We have the opportunity tonight to make a difference, to be some of the privileged few who can make a difference in our world tonight. What I'd like to do is, if you will hold off for just a few minutes while I read through this, I'll read through it quickly, but be patient as I read through. Let me go ahead and start with the scripture, Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And if we're going to go to the far left-hand corner. I'm trusting God to use Central Union Mission as one of his special tools to meet the needs of hungry, hurting, and homeless individuals and families in the Washington metropolitan area. In trusting him to increase my own faith, I promise to pray and ask God to supply the following support for this purpose in the coming year. Now, I mentioned to you that we're going to be asking you to give a gift tonight cash, check, or credit card. But in addition, I would also like for you to consider giving a gift over the next 12 months. Now, you can do that by giving a gift sometime within the next 90 days, or within the next 12 months, you can make a commitment to, to give a single gift. But maybe God is leading you to give a monthly commitment. And that middle section is specifically for you. So if you're interested in making a monthly commitment, that middle section is for you. It says, and or, if you would like to make a monthly commitment, please fill in the following section. Monthly gift of, in circle 50, 100, 150, 250, or perhaps God would want you to give more. And you could put X, we've got it on there, X dollars per month for a total of X dollars within the next 12 months. And then simply take that total for the total months and bring it over to line C. So let me give you an example. Maybe God has been leading you tonight to give a gift of $2,500. Well, how could you do that? Well, you could go to line A and put $100 there and then go to the middle section and you could take $200 per month for a total of $2,400 and take that to line C. So line A, 100, line C, 2,400 for a total of $2,500. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for us to accomplish our goal tonight, we are gonna need some gifts of 2,500, 5,000, 
10,000, but we're also going to need some gifts of 25,000, and maybe God is leading you to give that gift of $60,000 that we needed for rent for that distribution center. Now, I've got some good news for you tonight. I mentioned to you that our goal tonight was $260,000, and we were wondering how we were going to do that. Let me explain. We've got a handful of friends of partners of the ministry who have agreed to match every gift of $1,200 or more up to $130,000. That sound familiar? 130? Maybe our anniversary? We've got 102,000 of that already raised, and so all we would need then is just the remaining $130,000 to reach our goal. So if maybe God is leading you to give a gift of $1,200 or more, that's $100 a month, or $1,200 over the next 12 months, we can reach that goal. Now, some of you may be interested in giving a stock gift, and if you are, there's that section down at the bottom there. There's a little additional space. If you would just write stock gift, and someone will contact you about how to give a stock gift. Now, let's go to the far right-hand side. as your name, your spouse's name, your address, your city, state, and zip, and your phone number and email address. And I know many of you have asked about giving via credit card, and certainly you can do that through Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover. But please let us know if you intend that gift to give on a single basis over the next 12 months. What we would hate to do is if you put $1,000 there and forgot to put that it was just a single gift and we started charging $1,000 a month. Now, that wouldn't be so bad if you wanted to do that, but we just want to be careful. And then, of course, uh, you put your expiration date and the account number and your CVV and your signature on that. Okay? Great. Well, I'd like to just take a minute and pray for us, and then some music will play in the background, and uh, we'll let you fill these out. So let me take a minute. Heavenly Father, what a blessed evening. I thank you so much for just providing so much for 130 years you have used Central Union Mission as one of your special tools, and I pray that you would continue to guide and direct the leadership, the staff, the volunteers, that you would use every partner here tonight to make a difference. And maybe, maybe you placed an amount on someone's heart tonight, and uh, maybe when they came in, they thought about one thing, but maybe you had placed an amount that's quite a bit larger, and I pray that they would trust you for the amount that you place on their heart tonight. And I thank you for your blessings and for your provision that you would be lifted up and glorified in everything we do. In your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Music will play, and please fill out your envelopes. And when you get done, your table hosts, just please take the big envelope and send it around the table so we can keep this in confidence. So allow your guests to just put the little envelope in the big envelope. And table hosts, just as a reminder, you have attendance sheets. If you didn't fill out the attendance sheets in there during dinner, please fill them out now, and we'll be good to go. I just want to talk about grace. And what would I say if 
perfect if the love of Jesus had never opened my eyes. God bless you tonight. So one final ask. Let's pray. Father, as we finish our evening here tonight, we are mindful of those in Southeast DC in the Lambert House, those families that are laying down to sleep. And the men who live in the Gospel Mission House that are making their way in. And the 140 beds at Gale School that are making their way past lockers and towards their beds. And we think about the families that will be in line on Tuesday at the food center. And we simply ask that they would experience your grace, your love, and your peace. And may we also, as we go this night. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>